Every month, World Sports Cars magazine brings you unrivaled coverage of a selection of high-performance cars. And now, for the first time, we bring them to life. This is Pendine Sands in South Wales, where between 1924 and 1927, the world land speed record was broken five times. Later on in the programme, we'll be driving two cars on the sands that can exceed those land speed records, the Porsche 911 Turbo and the Mercedes-Benz 500e. We'll also be running Ferraris 348 and the Honda NSX back-to-back -back at Pembury Race Circuit. But first, we go over to the Ministry of Defence test track at Chobham in Surrey, where David Sumner-Smith is with the Lamborghini Diablo. The sports car is dead. That's what they said back in 73 when the oil crisis hit. The last two decades have proven how absolutely wrong they were. The 70s and 80s have been the most exciting decades in the development of the sports car. We've seen the very rapid rise of the Japanese with important cars like the Honda NSX and the Toyota MR2. We've seen some fascinating technical developments as well with anti-lock braking, four-wheel drive, four-wheel steering and active suspension. Most exciting of all though has been the development of the 200 mile an hour club. Now a lot of the members, of course, are specialists who modify and improve on existing exotics. But some cars have been developed for 200 mile an hour performance right from the word go. Fastest of them all is Lamborghini's Diablo, the Red Devil. V12 power has been part of the Lamborghini story since the early 60s, of course. But this unit has grown an awful lot since the 4-litre unit first used in the Lamborghini Miura. It now stands at 5.7 litres. It's got four valves per cylinder and Weber Morelli fuel injection. That takes it up to 485 brake horsepower and 428 pound-feet of torque. 16% better than the fastest of the Lamborghini Countach family. In terms of out-and-out -out performance, the Diablo is very much more impressive and convincing. We're talking here about a car that can accelerate from 0 to 60 in less than 4 seconds. We're talking about a car that's been recorded at in excess of 207 miles an hour. But it's a car that takes some driving. It's delightful driving on roads like this, but in traffic, absolute misery within 10 minutes, I'm sure. The performance is stunning. Quite incredible. Slice the gear lever across the gate to select third. It's immediately obvious that the car has a very powerful soul. The Diablo makes no bones about the fact it can deliver a mighty shove. But by the same token, the urge is smooth, unlike the wild punch in the back you'll receive from a turbocharged supercar like a Ferrari F40 or a Porsche 959. As you can see, the Diablo has a form which is sleek, attractive and modern. Marcello Gandini has much improved the aerodynamics over those of the Lamborghini Countach. The CD is now registered at 0.31 compared with 0.34 for its predecessor. But looking at the shape of the Diablo, it's small wonder that the car is so very successful. The waiting list stands already at four and a half years, despite a price tag in the UK in excess of £150,000. There are few clichés that have not, at some point, been directed at the most basic of sports cars, the Caterham Super 7. And in the latest Vauxhall-powered HPC derivative, you can add 10% to all of them. It's shatteringly fast, with 60 miles an hour coming up in less than five seconds from standstill. The 7 may be basic, but it is still one of the great motoring experiences of all time. From Southern California, where it never rains, comes a new dynamic roadster concept in the shape of the RX. Powered by a twin-turbo Corvette V8, its designer claims a 200 mile an hour top speed and a 3.4 seconds 0 to 60 miles an hour time, but will want £150,000 for a car like this. 
Good news for enthusiasts, though, is the possibility of a British buyer for the project. One of the potentially most exciting cars of 1992 is the Ford Escort RS Cosworth. Created by the shoehorning of the Sapphire Cosworth's four-wheel drive running gear into the smaller, lighter Escort body shell, this is a world rally champion in the making. With 220 bhp and 150 miles an hour capability, the road car will be hot. The competition car just a huge spoiler in the far distance. The Renault Alpine GTA in Britain had, in its previous guise, everything. Looks, performance, grip, handling, all were of the highest order. But buyers here just didn't buy it, and its makers will be hoping for greater success this time round with the 80% new A610. With more power, 250 brake horsepower, a higher top end, 165 miles an hour, and a sub £40,000 price tag, the credentials are as right as ever. When Toyota's luxury division, Lexus, set out to build a world-class saloon, they did so in the LS400. With the brief now extended to a world-class coupe, they present the SC400. It's not yet available in the UK, but given the slightest encouragement, this enormously capable 4-litre V8 engine Grand Tourer will push the established marks hard and long. The AC Cobra is dead. Long live the Dodge Viper, the concept revived. It can top 180 miles an hour, cover 0 to 60 miles an hour in 4.3 seconds, yet is powered by a truck engine, albeit a 400 brake horsepower 8-litre V10 and its target price in the US is the equivalent of just £30,000. Good news is that Viper sales will start in Europe in 1992 or 1993. The remote Pembrey circuit in South Wales provides the setting for our back-to-back -back comparison between two supercars, Ferraris 348 and the Honda NSX. Ferrari are one of the world's great supercar builders. The Dino, the Daytona, the Testarossa, the F40. It's a heritage and one which the 348 continues. It's a direct replacement for the 308. 348 shown at the Frankfurt Motor Show for the first time in 1989. It's small, it's the smallest of the current Ferraris, but its performance credentials are no less large than its illustrious predecessors. It has a three and a half litre V8, producing 300 brake horsepower. It's enough to see this car to 171 miles an hour and from standstill to 60 in a little over five seconds. That's extremely quick by any standards and faster than the Honda NSX, if only marginally. With roads or track sympathetic to the Ferrari's cause, there is a greater case for pushing on with vigour. The immediate vicinity is punctuated by the click of the gate and the rise and fall of the engine's howl. Perfect mating of the internals each time, every time, comes only with practice and effort, but the rewards are tangible and are there for the taking. Short sprints between corners are powerful. 30 to 50 miles an hour in fourth gear can be dispatched in a little over five seconds, about the same time it takes the 348 to lift its skirts from standstill to 60 miles an hour. The mid-range is the optimum playground, however, and Marinello's spider becomes a vision realized. Everything you've heard is true. These are special cars for special moments. That the process is not perfect, not entirely without fault, adds as much as it takes away. The 348 profile is crisp, clean and modern. It has a broad, purposeful stance and the wide tyres on 17-inch alloy wheels fill out the wheel arches precisely, but not to excess. The basic shape of the La Pininfarina styled 348 is an uncompromising wedge. But unlike the sharp, hard-edged designs of the 1970s, which all Ferraris save for the Bertone Design 308 have resisted, the 348 is gently curved over its upper surfaces. Though the interior of the 348 is as nice a place to be as the NSX, it's totally different. There is Magnolia Connolly leather everywhere you look and touch, and it's all far more special. The driving position, equally, is less accommodating than that of the NSX. It's offset to avoid the wheel arches, and it's slightly less comfortable. Your arms are straighter, your legs are bent. Unsurprisingly, there is little or no pleasure to be had in attempting to use the 348 on a daily basis though few owners will even try. Nope, the Ferrari is more of a weekend car, one kept more for sheer driving pleasure. 
but the benefit here is in being able to walk away from a car of which such great expectations exist to find them fulfilled. That Japan's first supercar should be built by Honda will be no surprise to anybody who's into Formula One. They've powered successive world champions and have dominated the sport for just about five years in conjunction with McLaren and Williams. The NSX is their first attempt and as you might expect of somebody with such credentials, it's enormously competent. It's powered by a 274 brake horsepower 3 litre V6, will top out at 165 miles an hour, where it's legal of course, and will cover from standstill to 60 miles an hour in 5.8 seconds. Perhaps surprisingly, it's enormously user friendly. It's easy to get comfortable in, easy to see out of, and very, very easy to drive. Unusually, the Honda NSX is offered with an automatic transmission. It's the first mid-engined production car in the world to do so, although Toyota with their MR2 and latterly Lamborghini with their Diablo can now offer the same self-shifting option. But perhaps even more remarkable than the car's overall level of competence is the fact that on the road in the UK it costs just £55,000, £21,000 less than the Ferrari 348. Well herein lies either the Honda NSX's greatest asset or its biggest bugbear. The interior is comfortable, accommodating, throws at you every conceivable automotive development of the last 20 years. There is leather, there is air conditioning, there is a prime stereo system. Everything falls nicely to hand, it is easy to get comfortable. Many will want that from a supercar, others most definitely will not. The handling of the NSX deserves considerable praise. Honda have gone to a great deal of trouble to achieve a very fine balance and the stability of the car right up to the limit of adhesion is highly commendable. There is a switchable traction control system which is more than useful in slippery conditions and in testing we ran with and without it. Without it the car is very progressive right up to the point where it moves into oversteer. With it everything is nicely controllable. All of the major stalk controls are located on satellite pods either side of the steering wheel. It's all geared to making the driver comfortable and able to use this car to its best effect. As you might expect, the Honda is a very effective tool. On open roads, it is easy to conduct extremely quickly with apparently little effort. For some, that will not be enough. They will demand more from their supercar. But for many, that will be all that matters. Where Ferrari offer emotion and bravado, Honda bear a soul born of careful calculation. That makes the Ferrari undoubtedly the greater car in shorter bursts. But if your idea of a supercar is something that should be enjoyed every day, day in, day out, then it has to be a Honda. From the makers of the cheeky MX-5 Roadster comes the all-new but similarly stylish MX-3 Coupe. Available with a silky smooth 1.8 litre V6 power plant, this diminutive Mazda provides stiff opposition for Honda's petite but soon to be revised CRX Coupe. Porsche have replaced the long-lived 944 with this, the 968, with the new front and rear styling echoing the 928 and a midsection and uninspired interior carried over on block from its predecessor, the 968 main gains are under bonnet. Here, a unique Vario cam brings greater smoothness and flexibility to the three litre four cylinder unit, but so it ought with a 40,000 pound price tag. Munich's Koenig Specials take a Group C Porsche 962 and transform it from its competition specification into a racetrack refugee for the road. Sales volumes won't be great with a price tag of £600,000. It's enough reward to see the project completed, say Koenig. Their financiers were not available for comment. A British pre-war coach building name is revived in the V12 Jaguar powered William Town styled Railton. Rebodied entirely by hand, these magnificent £105,000 roadsters are beautifully made and offer a genuine alternative to the Bristol or Aston Martin buyer. Production will be limited to just 50 cars. 
If, as is said, fortune really does favour the brave, then Nick Butler is soon to find some reward from his gold motor company in the dramatic Cirrus. A striking body of the highest construction standards envelops all-wheel drive and a mid-mounted Rover V8 engine. The result? An eminently usable 140 mile an hour compact supercar. Britain has long led the specialist sports car field. Lotus, Morgan, TVR to name but three, followed closely of late by the Scunthorpe-based Janetta cars. Their latest flame is the raw but ultimately refreshing G33, a 3.9 litre V8 in a lightweight body combined to offer 150 mile an hour performance for just £18,000. There is growing public interest in the world's land speed record. The first man to reach 150 miles an hour officially is Malcolm Campbell with a sunbeam. Seagrave now takes the record by a small margin. A month later, Parry Thomas, a gifted engineer and designer, puts the record up by nearly 20 miles an hour with his aero-engined car, Babs. A great battle is now on to be the first man to reach three miles a minute. In January, Campbell arrives at Pendine with a completely new car, the Napier Campbell Bluebird. He takes the record, but just fails to reach the magic 180. On Thursday, the 3rd of March, Parry Thomas is feeling better after a bout of flu and decides to make his bed. On the first two runs, Babs is fast, but not fast enough. On the third, she is seen to be smoking. One of the great individuals of motor racing is dead. 64 years on, we come to the venue that once played host to the fastest men on earth. Again, as with Babs, in a modified Benz chassis, but now in the form of a Mercedes-Benz 500E. A car which, though self-restricted to 155 miles an hour top speed, can comfortably exceed Sir Malcolm Campbell's 1926 world land speed record. Alongside the 500E, we're running the 911 Turbo. In its latest guise, the fastest ever factory 911, indeed the fastest ever factory Porsche, save for the now departed 959. This car can touch 169 miles an hour all out on the eight mile sands, sufficient to stay head to head with Parry Thomas's first record run. This is the pace of progress. The new generation 911 Turbo utilises the old flat six 3.3 litre power unit that dates back to the 1970s. It's retained in preference to a completely new starting point in the Carrera's superb twin spark 3.6 litre. Output nonetheless climbs by virtue of a larger turbocharger and a similarly bigger intercooler to a catalyzed 320 brake horsepower from a previous 285. In driving terms, the current 911 Turbo is unquestionably the best balanced and most capable of its ilk seen to date. The tail-happy traits of old have been tamed in the main, and where once discord prospered at the mere intimation of hard-charging manoeuvres, there is now harmony. The push-on driver will find reward in the new generation Turbo if he is prepared to work at it, coupled with a performance envelope that can blow your mind. When Lamborghini are asking £158,000 for the Diablo and Ferrari £123,000 for the Testarossa, there is a case of almost economics to be made for the ultimate 911. 169 miles an hour, 0 to 60 in 4.8 seconds for £73,000. And try telling that to your bank manager. Though understated in the extreme, the Mercedes-Benz 500E is a muscle car in the old-fashioned way. With a 5-litre V8 shoehorned into the engine bay of the W124 series, this is a mid-range saloon that's a match for any supercar. Were it not for the engine limiter restricting top speed to 155 miles an hour, the 500E is reputed to be good for 178. 
with acceleration from rest to 60 proved in 5.9 seconds. But despite the supercar type figures, the 500e has a very different, more refined pedigree. Mercedes-Benz are left in the 500e with a car that is almost overdeveloped. In order to make the 500e a marketable commodity, the left-hand drive only specification has been set very high, and that has taken a toll on the price. And the weight. The Mercedes-Benz 500e is a heavy car. A very, very heavy car. At times like this, you can't help but wonder if the 326 brake horsepower would be better attached to a four-wheel drive transmission. But that's not a genuine criticism, because if you want supercar performance in a smooth, svelte body shell, this is the one. Every month, World Sports Cars magazine brings you an unrivaled selection of high-performance cars. The quarterly World Sports Cars video series will be available from the spring of 1992. And you can subscribe now by dialing 081 877 1080. All major credit cards are accepted. World Sports Cars, Britain's fastest growing motoring magazine, is published by the Hyde Park Group.